recording. Okay, we're recording. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Q&A. How are you, Dad? I'm okay. I'm good, in fact. And I'm really pleased to see you. Good. Um, okay, well, what I wanted to start with was um, we had someone called Ian G say that um, he wanted to ask questions, but he doesn't have a Facebook um, uh, profile. Uh, and he brought up a good point, which was if you're not on Facebook, how do you ask questions? Um, and I told him if you reply on the video on YouTube, then I can get those questions too. So if you don't have a Facebook account and you want to ask questions, then just ask them on the last video and I'll find them. Um, the other thing is um, you're much more likely to sort of keep up to date and for me to see the questions if you subscribe. If you like the videos and subscribe, that's really great. And then you'll get notifications about the next one so you can see if your question comes up. So yeah, if you don't have a Facebook account, um, join in on the YouTube videos because I go through those too for questions. Info rogerdean.com. Dad says you can email info at rogerdean.com, but I don't have access to that, so I don't see those questions. So, uh, okay. so yes. <laughs> so YouTube or no. Facebook is how I'm going to see them, um, and that is the best way. Okay, so we'll start with Ian's questions that he's commented on the YouTube. Um, and his first question is, does Roger remember any stories about the creation of the Earth and Fire album cover from 1971? And were there two versions, one with a hidden blue figure beneath the cutout sleeve? Well, there wasn't intended to be any other than the original version, which did have the hidden figure. But, you know, as time goes by and record companies economise and it slips into um, the era of the DVDs, which are incredibly cut back. I mean, it's record companies should be ashamed of themselves at the economies they made to no benefit to the customer. Um, yeah, it was not meant, it was meant to have the blue figure. I didn't intend it to have any other version, but inevitably they did occur. What was the blue and, figure? Um, I'd have to find the cover. Why don't we revisit this question next time and I'll find the cover and show how it works. Okay. Because it was printed, it was printed inside out. So the outside cover <coughs> was really matte cardboard. We printed it with sepia ink on matte cardboard and the cutout showed the gloss colour printing surface, which was a basically a figure walking across a fiery landscape, a burning landscape. Hmm. Next time. The stories about it was part of the question as well. Or what no. was he thinking? The, the idea was very much about, about earth and fire, of course. And the idea was that um, there would be a scene, which was a tree with sort of caves among the roots. And inside the roots, inside the earth, was a fiery landscape with a figure walking across. So it was a play on the idea of Earth and Fire, the name of the band. Next question. Yeah. So his second question is, um, do you know why you weren't asked to create the cover for Greenslade's third album, Spyglass Guest, plus, his, plus your initial reaction to Patrick Woodruff's version of The Green Man on Time and Tide? So I'm just going to take I, the notifications off. I'm having a university friends reunion conversation going on. So it's going to go off about every minute. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> okay. 
So um, I had no reaction. At the time I was um, working, we had our publishing company, I think, by that time. And I was putting together one of, one of our main, a big project we did was to do a book, 48 page color book and story by Patrick Woodruff with music by Dave Greenslade. And they got on and they worked together. Um, I thought Patrick did a good job of it, to be honest. What about, um, hmm. Sorry, I didn't realize those two questions were part of the same thing. <laughs> having me ask you these things. I don't know what the, the, half the questions are talking about. <laughs> Well, maybe we should do a private Q&A where we get all the research material and then the public one. God, who has the time? <laughs> all right. right. I'm learning on the job. Me too. <laughs> hmm. I want to look at that though. I didn't, oh, it's a terrible thing to say now. I, I didn't realise Patrick Woodruff did album covers. Well, he did a few, quite a few, yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> I teased him. He, he did a lot of pictures. No, that's not fair. Not a lot. A few. Put your, put your screen down a bit. Your chin's not in the video. Yeah, he did a few paintings that were very clearly based on my paintings and in his book he credited me with doing it which was, I thought was very graceful of him he said I shouldn't treat it as I should treat it as a compliment which I kind of did but I when I spoke to him I said if you're going to do copies of my things like the green shade um, figure you might at least have the good grace to not do it better than me I remember when I was doing design technology at school, I did this um, CD rack with planished copper curved fronts and I was really pleased with it. And then this other girl halfway through her project just ditched it in favour of doing this curved wine rack with planished copper on the front. It's exactly like mine but for wine instead of CDs. And she got a better grade than me and I was so... <laughs> Can you remember going back to Patrick? Can you remember visiting him? Yeah, yeah, Patrick's biscuits. I remember those are digestive biscuits for anyone who doesn't know. But I used to call them Patrick's biscuits because he ate a lot of them. <laughs> um, and I remember something about snails, like a bucket full of snails. Yes, he did a beautiful decorated bucket with a wooden lid. It was beautifully made. And he would collect snails in his garden and release them in the churchyard. And I also remember his wife. Yes. Um, she, I think, so people could have a normal conversation, took me into the garden and uh, we blew bubbles. We, she had a little <laughs> bubble thing and we did that for a very long time. Long enough that I remember it being... A long time but I loved it <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was nice huh? they both were, yeah, they were yeah. Both. yeah it's funny isn't it because I think adults often maybe ignore or don't realize the impact they have on children but the fact is the children grow up and they remember <laughs> <laughs> they remember those people who were nice or not nice <laughs> and I remember that they were very nice Hmm. Patrick very sadly died a few years ago. Okay, should we go on? Yes. So, our next question. Do you prefer to paint large scale? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the name. So, yeah, again, so for these next questions, I'm really sorry. Some of them we have names for and some of them we don't, but... Um, 
I haven't gone through them this time, so I haven't got the names, but we'll get the names in future if you want to just tag yourself or comment that, if that was your question. But the first one is, do you prefer paint to paint large scale? Once upon a time, I painted very small and um, my eyesight was up to it, so I could do incredibly small and intricate stuff. But around 30 odd years ago, my eyesight, like everybody's, deteriorated and I find it harder and harder to focus close, so I had to wear glasses. And I can occasionally do very detailed stuff, but I need glasses and a magnifying glass and bright lights. So it's a, it's a big palaver to do it. So I tend to work much bigger so I can work much looser. And I actually love that process. So simple answer, when I'm working on a six foot by four foot painting, that is my favorite size, yeah. I do get pressured a lot by people who like to buy paintings that are smaller and would fit in their homes. So, so I do both, but I do like doing big, yeah. I mean, it's an, obviously like it's an issue here in Japan that's sort of talked about a lot. There's a phrase, I can't remember who coined it in the art world that, you know, bigger is better. But the fact of the matter is if you do anything bigger than about this, in Tokyo, absolutely no one will fit it in their apartments. <laughs> Even if they're very wealthy and have relatively large apartments. Obviously, I don't care and I just whack them up <laughs> and pack them in. <laughs> but if you like a kind of cohesive, you know, coordinated look to your home, then you can't really buy a lot of big pieces of work. Yeah. I do have, and I wish I'd marked it, a print of a Japanese artist. So it's an artist making a print of another artist doing a huge painting. And it struck me because it was very unusual. I'll see if I can find it. It's weird actually. Last night, uh, Mitsuyas and I were watching The Karate Kid 2. And I completely yeah. forgotten what happens in it. And they go to Okinawa. So um, Mr. Miyagi's dad is very ill. So he goes to Okinawa and Daniel, Daniel San joins him. And they're in uh, Okinawa and Mitsuyas is like, this is not Japan. And then I looked at it and I was like, you're right. I've definitely been to Okinawa and this does not feel, this looks like Hawaii. <laughs> and they built a whole like old farm village in Oahu <laughs> and it was the weirdest thing because like they it like if you half close your eyes it looks really convincing but then little things are very odd and you think why didn't they just use a real thing for that like when they go into Mr Miyagi's dojo family dojo there are all of these sort of portraits of his ancestors and they're like you know, they're like art school drawings from England. They don't look like Japanese illustrations at all. And you just sort of think, there's so many Japanese people working on this film. Why don't they just ask someone to bring a picture in of one of their ancestors or something like that? And like, and like they have these sort of, um, what are supposed to be, I guess, like tombstone kind of things or like garden ornaments but they're not stone or wood, they're like concrete. And you just sort of think, oh, why? <laughs> it's really bizarre, because when you, when you realize that it's a fake village, you're like, wow, that is quite an incredible feat. But then you're also like, God, that would have surely just been much easier to find some little fishing village somewhere in Japan. And I don't I did know. build a Japanese corner of a Japanese town for the last samurai. Anyway, I found the picture. So this is a Japanese artist doing a print of another Japanese artist doing a giant screen. That's fabulous. That's it is, fabulous. isn't it? Yeah. I'm impressed I found that. <laughs> yeah, and while I was talking, it was almost like you weren't really listening. I listened to every word. <laughs> 
Get on with it. <laughs> I don't know, it's just very surreal when I, yeah. And, and it was the first time, obviously, that I'd watched that film since I've actually been to Okinawa. And oh. just, it was just odd. It was just really odd. But you'll have to watch it again and see what you think. Yes, yes. <laughs> Have we got it here? We probably do, don't we? Yeah, it'll be somewhere, definitely. I tried looking for it, I think, when I was there, because we watched The Karate Kid together, didn't we, when I was in England? Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, so the second question. Have you any thoughts about which part of the painting you'd like to see on the CD cover, bearing in mind the shape constraints on the CD packaging? I guess this is a question referring to the DBA cover that you're working on now. Hmm. I haven't given it any thought. It's, it doesn't really trouble me much. I sometimes, when, especially when I was doing the very odd proportions of the, the two by one ratio, I, I did like that and I did like the weird design constraints. So I had a lot of fun designing pictures. And I think when we did the classes, we said that, um, you know, having an idea and then designing the painting is a critical part of it. A lot of very, very good artists don't design their pictures. They tend to put the subject matter bang in the middle and just, that's it. Um, but I, I love the design constraints of that ratio. So I did then and enjoyed it. Um, when I started doing my paintings in a three by two ratio, I decided I'm going to make the painting work and just focus on the painting. And afterwards, I can choose a detail for the front cover, put the whole thing inside, <coughs> excuse me. Or in fact, you know, put the whole thing on the front cover with text. So there were lots of options and I would always do it afterwards. And that's what I'll do with DBA. Do you do it just by eye or with it like a viewfinder or? Yeah, I just look at it for a while and think, yeah, that's the cover. That's where the logo goes. If I'm missing some bit I think is part of the narrative, I'll put the whole thing inside or that detail inside. Yeah. But at this stage of that painting, Absolutely not. I'm just enjoying the painting. I, I did an album cover for someone and I sort of, while I was working on the painting, I just felt like painting a little raspberry, a little screaming raspberry. I don't know why it came into my mind. I think I was just doodling a raspberry and then it looked like, you know, because you could see the underside of it where the hole is, you know, when you take the raspberry off. And it looked like it was just going like, so I put <laughs> little eyes on it. <laughs> Anyway, I scanned the work and sent it to them, expecting them to just sort of cut out the middle bit, but they really liked the raspberry, so they cut out the raspberry and put that somewhere in the booklet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? That was good, but you... It fell out of my paintbrush, as Michael Kaluta would say. It fell out of your paintbrush. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next question is really enjoying this piece originally you mentioned three who is the third to be for oh, so this is in reference to the fact that before you said you're working on three painting projects can you say what the third one is yet gosh prayer this is an incredible test of my memory what were the th what were the ones i mentioned well, the one that you're working on now, what did you do just before that? Or wasn't there one that you, there was a painting that you were working on? Mm. People, you're expecting too much from us. <laughs> Ask me <laughs> your questions, please. <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, I guess if I'm a huge fan of somebody's work, I want to ask about specific things that they did and how they did them. But actually, I also want, I'd, I think I'd also want to know things like, um, you know, what's your experience of people um, in one of the antisocial behaviour disorders? Uh, have you got thoughts on that? Do you have good ways of dealing with people 
who are borderline. Uh, <laughs> just, just, just things from life, you know, like um, what's your breakfast ritual? I, I think I'd also want to, so guys, if you want to ask dad like non-art related questions, that would also help me out considering I, you know, have gaps in my interest in dad's back catalog. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you can be vague as well. we can ask we can talk about life and stuff can't we yes but i think i know what the question was about it is about three yes projects three yes one was the live. yeah one was the live album which i'm surprised hasn't come out because i finished that painting some months ago and i don't know what date it comes out i'll try and find out. And the other project, which has been a long time coming, by a long time I'm talking something we've talked about for decades with the band and management, which is a box set for the Close to the Edge project with new paintings and a great deal more of the story included. And that is positively discussed for a 50th anniversary of Close to the Edge. But it isn't finalised at all. But that is underway. And yes, there is a, a third yes project, which I've had lots of talks about, haven't really started. And it's still, because it's an incipient project, it's still secret. Your video is a bit jittery, by the way, and not it's a bit slow can you shut your other computer or turn the turn your phone on airplane or something i don't know if those things work it seemed to work for us before didn't it it did um but i think what's happening is let me see if i i'm going to risk locking us out by hmm let me see, make sure i'm on the High speed, okay? Okay. Bear with him. We may have to reconnect. Okay. Right, I'm not on a high speed internet. Do you want to quickly switch? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Hopefully, Dad will be back in a moment. Um, yeah so yeah like I said before um, if I've asked some of your questions here and I haven't got your name comment your name and absolutely like if you want to ask more questions um, you can do it on the YouTube channel under the videos and yeah I is a, a slightly worrying one um, Richard Arthur Christ I guess is how you pronounce his name, which is very interesting, asks, I helped you to your feet when you tripped and fell up the stairway on the Royal Affair tour while in Bethel, New York. It was an honour. <laughs> Do you remember tripping up the audience stairway with a portfolio during the Royal Affair tour? I was so worried you might have injured your hand. Didn't happen, right? No, it did happen, but I didn't hurt myself. <laughs> it was, um, I don't know, I was just running around all over the place. <laughs> Bethel is where Woodstock is, by the way. Right. Do you remember Richard helping you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard. Whenever I trip, my memory goes blank. <laughs> do you remember anyone helping you? Yes, I do. Well, that will probably have yes. been Richard then. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. The next question is, are you aware of people making shirts with your paintings printed on them? Yeah, unfortunately there's way too many. <laughs> when there's companies like Redbubble who do it, we chase them, but um, 
you know, they're in total denial. They claim they pay millions of dollars in royalties and they only do legitimate things. But they've done hundreds of my designs. They've never asked permission and they've never paid royalties. I mean, there's... there are other companies. There are lots of other companies who do it. Yeah. I heard a really... we can find... Go on. Go for it, go. No, I said, when we can find them, we, we stop them. I heard an interesting solution for something sort of like that. Um, how those companies work is basically they allow people to put whatever images they want on merchandise that gets printed by that company and sold. So they say, there's a disclaimer usually if you want to do it that says, make sure you own the copyright to this image before you sell it through us. And that's supposedly their get out. Um, but it reminded me quite a lot of Twitter where a lot of people get harassed and bullied and threatened to the point they're sort of chased off it. And Twitter does very little about this. Um, you know, if you're very, very famous and someone sends you a death threat, they might do something about it. But if you're just sort of a normal person, maybe slightly in the public eye and you're getting like really badly trolled, they don't tend to do so much about it, which sort of disproportionately affects women who get silenced. It's a sort of really obvious form of, um, you know, silencing half the population uh, and they don't do anything about it. And one solution that I heard by Catelyn Moran was basically that we have a day or a time where everybody or all the women stop using their service and they see the impact of what they're doing. Um, or we just all come off it and set up our own that has administrators and can regulate itself because it isn't impossible. When you think about companies like Redbubble, what they do is they've made themselves unmanageable. Whereas there are companies like Contrado, uh, which I use, that are great. People can put their own designs on things and it's absolutely manageable. They don't take on more artists than they can kind of manage. So everything is really nicely done. Um, and the excuse that, you know, there aren't enough admins in the world to stop trolling, to stop people using images they don't own the copyright on is, I mean, just how is that an allowable excuse? <laughs> then you shouldn't be running a company if you cannot administer it legally, if you cannot make sure it is functioning in a way that is legal and fair, you should not be allowed to function. Well, here's the thing about Twitter. I think your idea about Twitter is a good one. It's not mine, that's it's a, Moran's idea. Okay, that's a good idea. You should do that. The Red Bubble situation is simply not the same because Red Bubble aren't swamped by lots of fan art, although they claim it is, it isn't. It is not fan art. By and large, it's art created in a design studio which presumably they control. It's not hundreds of people. They're mostly fake names. And it's oh, mostly... so what you're saying is it isn't like Twitter and it isn't people using a service. They are, they're bots. They're their own bots. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's what I'm saying, yes. And we went through it once and it, it was relatively easy to, what can I say, not prove it, but getting close to proving this was not independent stuff. Should we be saying this? It's... Sorry? Should we be saying this? That would be ironic, isn't it, if they sued us after using all of your <laughs> Well, they're stealing, basically, so what can you do? Can't not say it. People ask me all the time, is Redbubble a licensed company? And I say, no, it isn't. Zazzle as well. Is it Zazzle? They do. Zazzle? Yeah, I can't remember them all, but yeah. Anyway, next question. Next question. Um, do you turn down album art due to time constraints? Does that happen? Sadly, yes. There are often projects I think, oh, I'd like to do that one. And I just don't find the bandwidth. Um, 
I would, l <laughs> yes, yes, sadly I do have to, yes. But for the right price. Well, it's not so much the price, but literally the hours in the day, but go on. I don't, I, someone asked me to do a job that and the de they asked me a few days ago and the deadline was beginning of October and I was just like you have got to be joking and then I thought well, like they didn't give me the how much they're offering maybe it is doable <laughs> and I thought I don't want to ask because then it sounds like I might do it <laughs> tricky yes oh uh... Did you ever build Alan White's bedroom that you designed for him in the early 70s? I haven't a clue what that's about. Oh. Um, will you be revisiting any techniques no longer in your regular approach for the close to the edge revisit? I do. I mean, there are techniques that I do associate with my uh, early years in this business that I do revisit because there were things about them that I enjoyed. Um, when I did Osobisa, it was black and white ink drawing, incredibly intricate. And when I did um, the, the box set of their singles release, I did a drawing of elephants with tank heads on. And I did it in exactly the same technique. It was intricate pen and ink drawing. And I enjoyed that. It's very calming. <laughs> I mean, we were talking about um, the next course. We had a suggestion that, so the first course was acrylic painting from beginning to end, creating a painting. But we had one suggestion for the next course of being, learning how to draw and doing pencil drawings and then putting watercolour into that and that would have been something that you used to do like with Relaya and the Asia cover and you seemed like you wanted to find a way into that that would still infuse you but that would be something you the old techniques wouldn't it that you're thinking of doing again. I love drawing I love drawing and I love that quote of Michael Kalutas that you just did about that falling off the brush he says that, he said, oh, it fell out of the pencil. But when you are drawing and distracted, but totally into the zone, as it were, stuff comes out that you just don't expect. And it's wonderful. Mm. So good drawing, yeah. Good plan. Got another question? Yes. Um, did you do some work for heavy metal? No. No, we published a bunch of the original French artists of heavy metal and we have, which I won't repeat now, but when, because I know you have a time constraint, but one day when we have more time, I had a very funny story about heavy metal. Wait, I have, I have a sort of time constraint, I'll, I'll get a notification, but yeah, carry on, carry on until we can't carry on. Okay. Well, I met a lot of the art, the French artists. We published Philip Drouet's for, for example. And um, the person I never met, but I wish I had, was Mobius. I talked to his, I don't know if he's his agent or manager or friend, but I talked to him, but I never met him. But we did a book, we did a couple of books with Philip Drouet. Anyway, um, when I met them, they dressed like Edwardian English people with Norfolk jackets. And I don't know if it's just my imagination, but I imagined them in uh, Sherlock Holmes hats, <coughs> the whole works. And they were very, very turn of the century in the way they'd done their homes. And it was amazing. Anyway, um, we published these books and we were talking to them about various projects. And they asked if we could find them a publisher in America, um, a distributor they needed really. <clears throat> and it wasn't something we could do because we didn't have the infrastructure, but I thought big O posters could do it. So I said, yes. 
let me talk to Peter Lederer, Big Air Posters. And I talked to Peter and he looked at the magazine and he said, he could do an English language version. He said, absolutely, yeah. So I set up a meeting and Peter went to, to Paris to see them because Metal Holland was the original. It became heavy metal outside of France. Anyway, Peter went there and I never heard back from either side. So I rang Peter and I said, um, how did you get on in Paris? He said, oh, with the metal horn. They wouldn't speak to me. I said, that's ridiculous. They, want, they wanted you to do the magazine in America. And he said, well, they refused to talk to me. So I thought, no, 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 that's rubbish. So I ring up Metal Hall and I'm talking to him and I say, Peter came out to Paris to see you and he says you wouldn't talk to him. And they, they said, no, 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 no. He refused to talk to us. He told us to talk to his driver. I said, what are you talking about? Peter came there specially to see you guys. He's super friendly. <laughs> and they said, no, no. He kept pointing to his driver and saying, we must talk to him. I said, that makes no sense at all. Anyway, what happened was Peter, who was art director on Oz magazine, a sort of underground cult magazine, was a big friendly hippie. And he dressed like a big friendly hippie. But his sales manager, Ron Ford, dressed in a suit and looked immaculate. He looked like those French guys. <laughs> And they wanted to do the business with like, the guy oh, you, you kept telling us to talk to the staff. We don't yes. want to talk to the staff. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, who went in, as I say, in jeans and a floral shirt and sandals, they wouldn't talk to him. So a sad misunderstanding, a culture clash. Freya, you've gone invisible. I can see right through you. They, did anything happen with it? Did they get it going? No, sadly not. Anyway, that's my heavy metal story. Come up okay. with another so um, I kind of wanted to save this question till the end because I thought it sounded great. And um, having just been to a contemporary art fair in Tokyo, wanted to show something, which is what I just went to get. Um, but our question is, Japanese art has a great deal of symbology, much of it seemingly generally accepted by all artists. Is this something you, Roger, or Frey, have studied in depth? Is it creeping into Western art or unlikely to, in your opinion? Where have you gone? I can do it in... <laughs> I went to get a drink. I'm losing my voice. Uh. Well, I... I um... Weird, I got a book just now. <laughs> yeah. Carry on. I, got, I got a book just now. I, I think um, the influence of Japanese art on Western art is a century and a half old. Um, it, the Victorians discovered it and it's been weirdly re reciprocal because the Art Nouveau movement was heavily influenced by Japanese art. And in turn, a lot of Japanese art was influenced by the Art Nouveau movement. So it was, a, it was an interesting toing and froing. Alphonse Mucha is still a big deal in Tokyo, in Japan. So I would say, yes, it was one of the most fortuitous and happy things. This is, um, look at the dates, 1850 to 1930. It was a big deal. Oh, this is, I want to see that. This is another book. This is um, about Beardsley and Japanese art. Japanese. So I would say, yes, it's not a new thing. It's, um, well. I, I, went to, I went to this art fair of contemporary art here. I mean, the contemporary art scene in Japan is difficult because people don't have this sort of 
I had it explained to me really interestingly. Um, there isn't this culture of going around to people's houses and socialising inside the home. So you don't have this thing of buying art to sort of show to your friends. And my friend Alex, who owned a gallery, um, explained that art basically has three tiers. The top tier is your Picassos and your Andy Warhols and all the big ticket products. Your middle tier is all the sort of between two and ten grand kind of yuppies can buy it for their homes sort of you know you can you can affordable ish buy your own artwork and the bottom tier is the merchandise the tote bags the prints the posters all of that kind of thing and he said the top tier and the bottom tier japan have down but that middle tier of artists making art for normal people to buy just doesn't exist here um there isn't that culture for it uh, which means that it's very difficult to sort of survive here as an artist. But it's really unfortunate because it's some of the most fantastic art I've just ever seen. It's the reason I came here. And it's so interesting and so just incredible. And I just want to show you a couple of things that I saw at this art fair that I just absolutely loved. Um, for example, these are porcelain, porcelain sculptures. Yeah. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. Um, yeah. And they are like, yeah. and they are by, I should say, Aya Murata. Um, but I also saw this artist and I just wanted to show you one of his pieces actually because I absolutely loved it. I suppose what I'm getting around to saying is that I don't know if Japanese art, contemporary art is influencing the general art scene, but I hope so, because it's so bonkers and fabulous. Um, but this guy carves wood and his whole kind of shtick is doing joyful, joyful artwork. Um, so he does these sort of big wooden mad sculptures. Um, but one of them that I really loved, ah, this is the one. I really love this one. And to look at, you're kind of, you might sort of think, hang on, let me show you a better picture. You might sort of think, well, I've seen, I've seen more beautiful. I've seen, you know, more bombastic, but let me just read you this description. Canoeing in the early morning in Shikotsu Lake, her hair tied up in two pigtails like biking man, she spilled her cocoa on the canoe. She carefully holds her second serving of cocoa, surrounded by the colours of the trees and the light reflecting on the clear lake. And you can, oh, you can't really see, can you? You're but a scanner. I just, <laughs> I just thought, what a wonderful thing. All that is, is it's a girl with the, the mists of the lake enveloping her and her cup of hot cocoa and all the trees reflected in the canoe. And I just thought, what a wonderful thing to have in the home that that would be. And I think that yes. seems to be something people often forget about artwork. It's something that you should like enjoy spending time with. His name is Nohara, by the way. I um, but I wanted to show you this. You know Satoko, my manager at work? Yes. She no, I from LA. She yeah. I'm from LA, yeah. She gave me two things for my birthday. And one of them is this tea caddy. Do you recognise these symbols? The I Ching symbols. The yeah. I Ching. Well, they're not hexagrams, they're just trigrams. But yes, yes, I know them, yeah. And I was trying to figure out why would that be on a Japanese tea caddy? I would really like, you know. Did like you talk about your meeting with the tea master last time we talked? Yeah, we talked, yeah, we talked about that a bit. I just Did you have to talk with him? Huh? You're going to have a talk with him. Did you have it? Um, we are. Ah, so that's going to be on the 14th of October and I'll put a link up. So we're, yeah, we're going to, so actually that's the subject of a talk that I'm going to give is how Japan's traditional way of looking at and experiencing making art is going to influence the future of their art market and art world here because copying the Western model isn't working for them. Um, so will the future actually look something more like the past here? I would hope so. 
because it's so beautiful. Look at this. This is a fan. And all of these are poems by someone called Rick Yusen. And they're all poems about tea. Isn't that lovely? It is. Sorry, I just used that question to wax on about Japanese stuff. But I've just been seeing a lot of beautiful things from here recently. And I really hope, I really do hope it influences because actually going to that art fair, there's just so much joy and pleasure in the making that happens here. Like that piece with the canoe and the hot chocolate and the reflections, is it? I mean, you'd never see that in England, would you? <laughs> I, well, I've never seen anything like it. I just it England has a really bad Protestant hangover of anything pleasurable being seen as somehow morally corrupt. Or anything material is seen as materialistic. Hence, there was a great deal of enthusiasm in art schools here for conceptual art because it essentially didn't exist. It's, uh, it is a weird thing. You're quite right. Philosophically, it's weird. And it clearly isn't about art. Art is kind of a threat, especially if it's beautiful. Hmm. There was something I wanted to show you. Hang on a second. Can I have a quick look? You, you, okay. <laughs> okay, now we'll, we'll go through the questions and I'll show you. Well, uh, the, uh, that's, those are the main ones. The okay. other ones that I have, you've definitely answered in recent Q&As, so. Okay, well, I think this business about the interaction between Japan and the West and the West and Japan has been powerful and is ongoing. But I think, you know, I don't think Japan has a lot of useful stuff to learn from modern Western art. Well, what it has to learn is how to market itself to its own people and abroad. And whether you think that's an important aspect of art or not, that's, that's, what, that's the aspect Japan has to learn, if it wants to. It's a, it, of course it's important, because if artists don't survive, they won't exist, so they have to survive. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's the way that it's done. Um, somebody, we've got an art advisor at work and um, he was told recently by the guy who runs one of these art fairs, oh, giving too much away, but basically he said it's, it's a waste of time investing in artists who aren't already established. And that's their way of doing it, you know, there's, that seems to have been the lesson that you buy art because it's worth something and will accrue more value. And the safest way of doing that is buying someone who's already established. And it seems like what happened is we've absolutely skipped the area where people who can afford it, support, invest and encourage up and coming creative people. So you've got this whole just stagnant block of, artists and art that's not going anywhere and the people at the top who are kind of getting getting along okay and that just seems like not really the way to do it for me i would say that if there's a lesson to be learned it's to well, enjoy it the, yes yes that's the missing link in this is loving it so much that you really want to buy it or have it but the artists you mentioned at the top, people like Andy Warhol and Picasso, awesome. are beyond caring because they're dead. Hmm. Now stop. I think what will change everything is it, house prices. If there was some way of moderating their acceleration price wise so you could buy something so you could put holes in the wall to hang work so you could buy something a little bit more spacious that you could fit a dinner table in and have friends around and just start building a culture where art is part of the enjoyment of people and your life i mean i think everyone lives very temporarily here you know you sort yes. of you go to the big city you try and make your money 
you get stuck here because actually you can't just make your money and get out. You're probably going to be on the same salary for decades and you live like it's impermanent, like everything is impermanent. So why bother getting a bigger space? Why bother, you know, getting a dining table, putting art up? Who's going to see it? I've just got to make my money and get out of here kind of thing. And I think that the problem is for art, for you to want and buy and enjoy art, you have to have a home. <laughs> you have to have somewhere that feels like a home that you want to make and you have to have confidence in your own idea of what you like and I think that's something that definitely was a thing here that seems to in the city at least have been slightly bypassed in favour of just getting somewhere surviving in it sleeping in it for six hours and then going to work I think both Japan and Britain have big issues about making proper homes for people. We have to rethink the issue. It's perfectly possible. Space is, space is the issue. And we devote too much space to too much crap. You know, it's, um, there's no reason why a shopping mall needs so much space. Effectively, it could be a park, it could be underground. I mean, this is a... You don't, need <laughs> hmm? you don't need windows in shopping malls. You don't need windows in cinemas. You don't really need windows in sports stadiums. <clears throat> you don't need windows in roads. You not There's only all these them, they don't put them in. I think it must be the same philosophy as a casino. Because we were, we were in a department store today to just buy some sort of nice cards, you know, for a family member. Um, and there weren't any windows there. We could have been in there for 20 minutes or three hours and we wouldn't have known the difference. And that's the idea, isn't it? To sort of give this impression of time not being a thing. So you just endlessly trawl. You have converging. You have more display space if you don't have windows, as well as confusing the amount of time, as well as controlling the atmosphere. It's, we need to make cities in an entirely different way. Do you know what we need? We need things that people can do that don't involve spending money. And I don't know how you do that, because how can you buy space if you're not making money on it? But I was thinking this yesterday. So in Japan at the moment, it's silver week. So you have four days off in a chunk and everyone is going to the shopping malls and everyone is going, you know, to the cinema or whatever. But I was we were driving around and I just thought, I don't want to go home yet, but I don't want to spend money. And what else can you do in a city? There isn't anything you can do that's productive and fun. And I was thinking if there was like a sort of publicly owned plot of land where you can grow vegetables, I'd be happy to chip in for a couple of hours for no money, just to do something fun and nice and productive. Do you know what I mean? But there's nothing you can do that doesn't cost money if you live in a city, unless you just drive around or walk around. You should, it, you should go online and look at the gardens that have met, been made in some very poor parts of Detroit. Sort of urban gardens. The problem is though, Dad, if, if there's a square inch of space in Tokyo, someone's going to buy it and put a building this big and a hundred apartments in it that people have to live in. I know. <laughs> in Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Is that your other call you to do? No, 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 that was mum. Ah, <laughs> I see. I'm very in demand today. You are, you are. Well, I think considering the technical issues, we've roundaboutly done an hour. Okay. Well, we should talk about cities and architecture and how we could live differently on another occasion. And if you guys, if anyone watching wants to pitch in and join in the convo and not just ask Dad about his work, you know, <laughs> <laughs> comment, put in a comment or a question and 
subscribe to the channel as well because then you'll get the updates and it will be like more of a conversation because I miss I say it all the time I miss doing the live videos I miss this being like a big conversation with all of us so subscribe and comment and put questions in for the YouTube channel as well yes thank you I like that mug by the way I think my boss yeah, got it's me ceramic, but it's plastic it's metal is it yeah ah. Okay, I better go. Um, All right, my love. Okay, thank I'll you. Talk to you. Let, hang on, let's stop recording and then we'll sort out the logistics of how we're going to edit this. <laughs> thank, thank you, you for everybody. joining us. <laughs> huh? Thank you for joining us. It was wonderful. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll speak to you soon. Yes. Bye-bye.